sucks. That's the four, like give me some key things so that I can go and go, grab, look, review, give me 10 seconds to review this, walk in. How do you remember that, right? So you become a team that becomes a superhero. They're servant leaders. They're behind the scenes and they allow the space for people to grow into. I think that's a really important comment. You got $50 for 60 people. Like that puts you in a whole different bracket of like compensation. Like you have to quantify these things and bring the value to your pictures like you do your team. It's a team. Look, you go on vacation. You have the ability to make a lot more than your base salary or hourly if you're an A player. The reemployment rate is like 95 or above. That's the one thing that relates to the most healthy, productive, profitable business out there. And the DSO sits above and the profits blow up. It allows the marketplace to become the world for your practice. So your valuation it's been, it's actually been really great. Yeah. It's really been great to get me past some of the plateaus and obstacles I've had in my practice growth and development. And I've been blown away by both of them. I've been, I've been studying from afar, I've been learning from them, and they both are incredibly uh, genuine people, it seems like, and they want to help. And so when, they, when I heard they were putting on an event at the last Voice of the Industry, they made a mention of it, yeah. I walked up to them and said, I'm going to be there. And a lot of people here are the same way. I think that's why this is such a cool summit. It's different than any other CE because it brings like-minded people together. And um, I hope they throw it again next year because I'll be here. <laughs> <laughs>
a formal quote unquote kind of course. And I remember distinctly telling my wife, look, don't worry about all this time I'm putting into it. I'm going to run out of things to say. I might do this for a year or two and that's it. Well, needless to say, fast forward to the present. She reminds me of that time to time uh, with regard to, you know, uh, don't worry about it. You know, it'll be over in, in a couple of years. So that's kind of how it really began. And, um, you know, it's just blink of an eye here is 30 years later. I've thoroughly enjoyed this whole ride. It's been, it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun being able to interface with colleagues from all over the world. I've got now just over 4,300 alumni, all 50 states and uh, 43 countries. Uh, it's been a pleasure. It has. And as you know best, it's all about people. And I love the people I interface with. It's just been so much fun. This field, this profession is just an amazing uh, one for, for all of us. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's a testament too, because the even the younger generation, the guys that are, you know, just coming out three, five years, how the following that they have with you as well. Like uh, I want to mention Dr. Payman Raisi, uh, Pay Ray. I know he's going out there constantly. And when I listen to him and people, we've had him on the podcast and people are like, what, what do I need to do to, to do what you do? I mean, the first thing out of his mouth is you got to go to the Picos Institute. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I, 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 I hear it's been a great legacy and I hear that in your voice, but listen, it's, it's still an amazing, um, Thing that you've got going on and it's uh it's it's extreme it's more relevant now than i think ever before because probably back in the day and we've had this conversation before it was a lot of specialists were thinking that they need this training so you had this core like smaller segment of the whole pie of dentistry and i'd love to know what what percentage of the guys that come out for one course or another are specialists versus gps at this point that's a great question I, i'll tell you the the um the numbers were so different up to i would say about maybe eight, 10 years ago, or was primarily specialists, uh, 70, 80% roughly. And now the pendulum is swung in the other direction to where it's about a 60, 70 uh, split of re restorative based folks versus specialists, surgical specialists, i.e. surgeons, periodontists. So it's kind of swung the other way. And certainly purely on numbers, as you know, um, it, it does make sense. Uh, the, the trends are there loud and clear. Uh, we have so many ways to learn today, especially uh, via uh, our high tech uh, abilities across the board. So it's kind of leveled the playing field and, and made it very nice for so many of us to A, teach and B, learn. Uh, so with that said, we can, as you know, be learning 24 seven, that's good, it's bad, but the reality is it's there. And so we have a lot of adjunctive means of, of learning, uh, certainly, uh, IE videos, etc. But I think at the end of the day, the, the actual courses that we have and others have as well, certainly are alive and well for a reason. And that's because we're able to offer things that you can't pick up in a book or a video. Uh, there's, as we always talk about, there's a science and there's the art of what we do. And the art is something that has to be talked about almost like a mentorship kind of thing. So we pride ourselves in being clinically relevant, but yet evidence-based. That's so important. But the clinical relevance is huge. And that's something that we really have embraced from way back. And that's at the core of, you know, of what we do. And, and I've always talked about uh, the most important element of what we're about, and that is becoming this hybrid surgeon, a meaning having equal skill sets with both bone and soft tissue. When you can do that, boy, you've got, you've got some power. Yeah, and knowledge is power, as we know. So therefore, um, my, my challenge to all of my cor course attendees is the following. If you're surgical-based, you need to learn, um, I beg your pardon, if you're, if you're uh, an oral surgeon and or periodontist, you're, you're, I, back up, if you're a sur oral surgeon, you're bone-based, you need to learn more soft tissue. And the reverse is true if you're a periodontist. If you're restorative-based, then you've got to learn both. So therein is the challenge, and depending where you're at on that learning curve, that will dictate, of course, what you'll pick up you know, from our courses and others. But at the end of the day, you know, as I say always, you know, we, we continue to learn till we retire or die, whichever comes first. Uh, for me personally, you know, my wife knows the R word is not in the vocabulary. I've enjoyed what I'm doing. I continue to, I'm having more fun now than ever before wearing two caps. I'm still active four days a week as a clinician, but also have my educator cap that I've thoroughly enjoyed as well. So I'm able to do both. And again, I, I'm enjoying this now more than ever.
you know, it's funny. I know when we, we spent some time over here at my office and I, I know you, you and my dad had uh, quite a conversation. My dad is, uh, you cannot begin to talk to him about retirement. Like he got upset with me like 15 years ago. He's like, are you telling people I'm retiring? I'm like, dad, why the, why the hell would you say that? He's like, I don't know. Three or four people came up to me in the last month and asked me, when are you retiring? I'm like, that's what people want you to do because they just figure at X age, this certain age, you're supposed to retire. And um, retirement is a broken industrial age concept that actually came around. And I, I believe it was one of the Bismarcks, one of the um, rulers of Germany that said the labor force is getting too expensive because these seasoned right. people that are deserving more and more money are chewing up the labor market and costing companies too much. So let's force them out to pasture. But I mean, there's good evidence to show that retirement is bad for you. You can golf yourself to death. You can, you're not met, it's not a human condition to retire. And I think it's really funny because my dad made a deal with me. Pete, I don't know if I've ever told you this. But my dad's like, he was like 65 at the time. He's like, listen, Craig, why don't you pay me like X percentage of my production? I'm like, mm. dad, are you kidding me? That's like, that's unheard of. He's like, yeah, yeah, I know. It's a really, really high, you know, it's like really, really high. Like think of what a normal percentage would be and then double it and then add some. <laughs> And my dad says, well, it's not a big deal because, Craig, I'm 65. I mean, what do I got? Three, four more years? Meanwhile, 12 years later, 13 years later, he's cooking, knock on wood. I mean, he's, just, he's just so – he's loving what he's doing. He's freaking great at it. He gets to, you know, put on his educator cat at a small uh, – um, example because we've got all these young doctors here to mentor. He's so good with patients. Patients don't care. You know, I mean, there's Absolutely. no, there's no negative. Um, no. And I, and I can relate to that totally because number one, think about it. Um, as you see patients coming into your practice that have just retired. I mean, for me, it's been very distinctive. I can pick them out, physicians, you name it. And they come in a year or two out and Hey, Bill, how's it going? Oh, I'm so happy. I'm golfing four days a week. And, and they're aging like right in front of me. Yeah, it, it's yeah. amazing. Truly. These are, you know, really sharp people. Uh, and that's kind of scary, but, but aside from that, you know, I, the way I see it is number one, what would I do if I retired? I've got a lot of, you know, things I could enjoy for, to, for, to a degree, but nothing is more satisfying than what I'm doing right now. And, you know, the Japanese have a, a saying, um, actually, let me back up. The Japanese have no word in their vocabulary for retirement. It really? doesn't exist. And the reason is nobody retires over there. This term uh, ikigai uh, is an interesting one. It, it has to do with purpose in life. And they basically are saying, you find your purpose in life, you continue to do it till you die. And it's pretty much that, that straightforward. And the way I see it, you know, we're kind of like a bottle of wine. Your dad, myself, others, as you get older, you 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 have more value, uh, and as consultants, kind of people, those in, in in out in the business world, they demand and command more money, and even some of them make way more money in retirement, quote unquote, or semi-retirement, than when they work. But mm -hmm. it's not about the money; it's just that the stimulation element is so amazing, and I can relate to how your dad's getting cranked up with the younger folks around him, etc. For us, it's a technology that I absolutely rave over and try to keep as current as I can being an educator as well as a, a clinician. So all that kind of comes together. And at the end of the day, why would I walk away from it if I'm physically and mentally able to continue to do it? And Simulation the, is, is amazing. And by the way, it bears some mention too, because there's a pervasive uh, belief in dentistry of this you know, open up a bunch of offices and sell out. So that, so let's, let's bring this conversation of what would we do after dentistry, take away the age relationship to this conversation and bring it to these guys that Pete and I meet all over the place and they have five practices or, or they're growing from one to two and the goal is to get to 10 and then sell it. And I always say, well, why do you want to do it? Well, of course, you know, I'll make a ton of money, you know, sure. I'll get four times or five times multiple on my one practice, but on the earnings of my one practice, but I can get to 10, I can get to eight. I'm like, okay, so great. You'll have, you know, X number of millions. What are you going to do? And people are shocked when you ask somebody, what are you going to do after you get double digit millions? It's funny. They laugh. They're like, what do you mean? Why would you ask me? Of course, I'm going to drink champagne and drive a Ferrari. I'm like, for how long? And they laugh again. They always think it's funny that you're asking them. Like, yeah. how, why would you even say that? No, I'm curious. How long do you want to drink champagne for? Yeah. Month, two, three. And what do you do after that? Mm -hmm. So it's not even an age con. It's not even, it doesn't matter if you're 60 or what, if you're, there's 40 year olds that have sold out for double digit millions. Of sure. sure. What are you doing? I mean, it's fun as hell for a little bit, but then what's your, 
Well, What's that your d- too comes with like, you, know, you just need to be aware, like your self-awareness and what brings you fulfillment. And if it's, if it's that and going to the next chapter and doing something else that fulfills you, but you're right, Craig, you, that can't be the, the ultimate chapter in your book, the legacy at 40 to say, you know, because like you said. You, yeah, but there's a pervasive conversation. In right. It, but it may be someone that, else's narrative, right? Like, so right, but we're, we're, we're wildly, we're wildly drinking. We're, we're predominantly drinking that Kool-Aid of work. No, absolutely. And, and unfortunately, you're right. It, 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 I've heard a lot of that, certainly. And, uh, and it's true. There, there's no doubt there. It's out there. But again, at the end of the day, you know, what's your purpose? What is your real purpose? And uh, as Peter mentioned, if it's a means to an end to go to something bigger, better in terms of, of a business scenario, well, then so be it. But for basically, I would say virtually everyone else, um, at the end of the day, what do you really want to be doing? And what is your legacy uh, as well? Uh, certainly families first and foremost, as far as legacy goes, but then from a professional standpoint, what do you want to be known for? What, what do you want to look back and say, I, I, I made a difference. I made a difference. And that's how I see it. Uh, I could have retired eight, 10 years ago. What would I be doing? What difference would I, would I have made at that point? Nothing compared to now. And yeah. I continue to see the, you know, the, the reason that I I'm doing this. So it, it makes all the sense. And that's only increasing, meaning your, your contribution and your legacy is only increasing kind of, you know, I wouldn't even call it more linearly. I'd almost call it, you know, there's kind of a log scale as it goes up because your distributions increase. And then those people then are, are, you know, what am I trying to say is that basically well, well, it's, I, it's also I, Pete, uh, let me try to bail you out because I'm thinking of the same thought. <laughs> I think it's, I wasn't in need of a bailout yet. Well, was, I'm just, I'm preemptive. <laughs> I'm preemptively like, like insulting you. Cause what you really meant to say was, yeah. This. Yeah, just stop talking. Okay, Pete. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> tuning um, out, tuning out. No, I, I, Pete, Pete always says this to me too, and I, I think this kind of hits the nail on the head, is that you know, with 4,300 alumni, Dr. Pete goes, how many patients have you affected? You know, so this, that, that's the real law of exponential return because you can do your thing two, four days a week, and great, you're going to see four or five patients, you're going to affect their lives, but you've got 4,300 trained dentists that are doing you know, by, by and large, a lot of what right. you do. Absolutely. I, and, and, you know, I've, I, I, I've thought of that time to time and, uh, and, and that's so impactful. It, it, and it does make me feel good mm-hmm. because indirectly, as I've always said, part of us lives on as educators and I'm the product of uh, so many people before me. Oh my gosh. I, I would, t- it would take hours to give credit where credit is due. And, and so therefore I'm just, part of again i'm a compilation if you will of of so many other individuals and then as i continue to hand the baton on you know off to somebody else and all these folks it it just continues to 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 exponentially uh expand so therefore i'm a facilitator that's really the best uh descriptor i would give for myself as opposed to say educator as well as clinician Uh, facilitator meaning i'm facilitating so much material that I've learned over the years from so many people and hybridize it into the way I do things. Sure. Am I innovative? Yes. I, I'll take credit for a number of things, but at the end of the day, I'm still uh, a, a, a product of so many different individuals that came before me. So therefore the, the, the legacy, if you will, then is that I can continue to act, actually pass on what they passed on to me it may be different forms, certainly, et cetera, and more modernistic, updated, all that good stuff. But it's kind of neat to know that. So, but in turn, what you said is so true that it's now impacting on a personal level, individual people everywhere throughout the globe. That's neat. That, that's, that's an absolute, uh, the ultimate of satisfaction to me. That's so cool. That's really Doc, cool. I want to ask you, like, so you, being an educator and obviously having an institute that you see so many, you know, see, you said generalist and you see so many specialists, but what are you personally, like, what's on the horizon that are you, you are most excited for in dentistry? And we can talk that, about that clinically, if you will, because you're on the forefront of the technology, but like, what's really got you lit up right now? I would say two things. The, the digital workflow element, I think, is, is certainly one that we can all um, get very excited about and, and certainly embrace in such a way that the impact is going to continue to be just an amazing 
one for for all of us, no doubt. Mm -hmm. I, I really wish I was starting over now, knowing what I know now, and having access to this technology for a longer time than I will. Um, but I will say that that's probably the single big one, uh, for sure. Uh, and being able to work in this digital world now is is an amazing one. And you two are at the forefront, certainly from an education perspective. Uh, the book you've written, which I have read and have thoroughly enjoyed, um, mm -hmm. you're you're definitely um, pioneers with regard to to that and the impact it's had on on practices, certainly. Uh, but the impact is going to continue to be amazing. And then secondly, the along that same line in terms of new technologies, I'm involved with um, with a study now coming up uh, that deals with a, a particular bone cement uh, that's going to, I think, revolutionize uh, the way we bone graft in general. Uh, because if, in fact, um, the dog studies have shown what they have, if we can now show with what we'll, I'll be doing with one other center, uh, on humans that this cement really does work where we can place an implant that has zero mo uh, zero immobility in other words it's mobile you can take and move it it's in maybe two millimeters of bone and literally inject this bone cement and within 10 minutes the pull-out torque is about 70 newton centimeters wow. i think you'd say like wait a minute that's impossible and then the better part of it is that over time this this material resorbs with, with zero foreign giant body cell reactions. I think you'd say, wow, that's pretty cool. And it is. <laughs> so, so far, the dogs have come through for us. But now myself and, and um, another uh, university center are going to be involved with this uh, study. So it will be interesting uh, to see wow. um, how that works out. But I'm really excited about that and related type of, of materials and technologies that are going to become available to all of us. And it, it, it's just accelerating at such a quick pace now. I used to tell all my course attendees that the non-core material, meaning anatomy is not going to change, you know, things like that, of course, but the non-core material that I'm presenting for these three or four days, within, say, three years, the half-life is like, you know, it is three years. That's a half-life. No, now it's about a year plus. That's crazy, which means what I'm sharing, like this past weekend, I had my advanced bone grafting course, which is my only four-day course, where I cover single tooth to full arch reconstruction and everything in between, a very uh, intense four days. On day four afternoon, when I make that comment, everybody's looking around like, you're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. Everything I've just shared with you folks <laughs> is going to be obsolete other than non other than our core material within about a year maybe year and a half it's kind of scary wow. but it's true scary. it's reality but i mean look at how it affects the patient's lives so we all all three of us have been practicing long enough to you know to, to have not been able to provide nearly what we can do today for patients. So I remember, you know, before immediate load and, and even when implants were first coming out, you know, it, it was, it was incredibly difficult to, to give the patients the treatment that they wanted. We had to give them a series of, you know, letdowns. So it's going to take this so much time and you have to, you have to wait. I mean, now look at the hybrid technology, all in four technology, that stuff was, it was science fiction just for me in dental school. And I went to dental school in the 90s. Invisalign, CEREC, yeah. I mean, the aesthetics that we have, it's just gotten so much better for patients. And I, I actually think that's why the golden era of dentistry is here. Patients' experience is so much better. And that's why it's so disheartening to me. I, I, I probably spend too much time on some of the Facebook chat rooms where it's like they do these polls with dentists. Would you recommend your son or daughter going to dentistry? And by and large, in some of the spaces that I'm paying attention to, it's, it's an overwhelming no. And it's such a travesty because I love it. I can clearly, you know, feel and sense your passion for it and the people that are coming to you. But there is another narrative going on that, that it's not as good as it is. And it's really unfortunate because it's such a beautiful time in dentistry and it's still such a beautiful profession. I couldn't agree with you more, Craig. I, I have echoed those same sentiments to I can't tell you how many folks over the years now. I have literally talked a number of younger individuals out of medicine and into dentistry mm -hmm. for that exact reason. I think we're alive and well. And sure, we've got challenges we always have had. But what a, what a great time to be practicing dentistry. I totally agree. This is another golden age. Absolutely, yes. Um, I just think there's so many opportunities, so many neat things that we can do that um, uh, it, it just, I, I believe it's just a fascinating field 
for, for so many reasons now. And, and you know, you know contrary to is. the doomsdayers that, you know, are out there telling everybody, you know, we're, we're going to be dead in no time and this and that. And no, not at all. I, I think it's important just to mention too, you know, what, what's, what's fulfilling in all three of our careers, I think is we've had a lot of transformation. You know, I went from being a dentist, just my dad. And then I, brought on additional people. So I had to refine leadership skills and I built the building. And so we've all put on so many different hats throughout our career. And I just want to, you know, send a message to the, to those that are listening that might be getting bored or a little stale. It's really up to you. You can define what type of dentist and type of dentistry you want to do. Right. And just because you're pigeonholed because you haven't maybe taken as much continuing education as you'd like, or you haven't made the time you can do it. I mean, a, a buddy of mine was just, you know, over at your course and saying there's people that are, you know, well-established into the careers that are taking this stuff for the first time. And, you know, so it's, there's never, it's never too late. You know, my dad, we had a prep course here at my office on last Thursday and some of the doctors took off a little early, but my dad, 77 years old, was there asking questions nine o'clock, like looking at things really, really into it. And some people are 50 and saying, oh, you know, it's too late for me. The ship has sailed. Exactly. And it's a dangerous conversation to have because I think it's. It is. It fulfill, is. I, f- fulfillment is uh, linked to progress, progress exactly. and growth. You have to keep growing. You can't stay stagnant. The exactly. cool thing is, too, talking about technology, and you, you mentioned the contrast between physicians and, and dental school and, and dentists, and you kind of pushing people towards dentistry is that, like Craig is saying, there's, there's no rules. And, you know, I got out of dental school, and, and I was kind of told, well, this is what you'll do for the rest of your life, and this is the practice you'll have. And, you know, my instructor has told me that, you know, you're not going to specialize, so this is going to be your life. And this is, you know, like everything was laid out, and I was kind of like, oh, okay. And like when I got out, I realized like, wait a second, there's no rules, there's no ceilings, we can do whatever we want. And there's a lot more freedom in terms of clinical perspective. Like Craig, you know, you, you do just, you know, if somebody told you in dental school, like, hey, you're probably just gonna do Invisalign for the remainder of your career once you hit X, you know, you'd be like, what? No, I'm gonna be doing crowns all the time, right? But like, you know, and the generalists learning the tech that are now placing more and more implants and getting better with soft tissue and bone and all this stuff. Like there's just no rules or getting multiple practices if that lights you up or, you know, there's just no rules. And I think that's, I think that's my, was my takeaway. And I came out a little bit brainwashed, like, okay, like, this is what I'm going to do. But and you can also be an educator now without a classroom. Yeah. So, you know, there's tons exactly. of these Instagram influencers that are just doing really cool crap on a daily basis. And they're putting it on their Instagram feed for no money. And they're getting tens of thousands of followers. And they may practice in another country. So mm-hmm. the fulfillment that they can have without having to have, you know, the, the infrastructure of, of lecturing. It's just, it's such a cool thing that we have this, you know, flow of information. And, and I mean, even, even a podcast like this, people would have had to spend a lot of money just to hear yeah. you give, giving this hour of your time. And now it's, it's being paid forward. It's super, it's super cool. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm really excited about the future. I, I do want to touch about one. I do want to touch on one thing. I'm just trying to figure out how to approach it. Cause I don't want to ruffle any feathers. Um, I want to talk about specialty in general. Um, and I know, I know I'm talking with a specialist, but I guess my first question is when you started training GPs, uh, you know, when it started to become more and more, do you remember getting any pushback from some of your specialty colleagues? Like, don't, this is not, you know, you're, you're selling out or was there any pressure on you uh, ad, negative pressure against you doing that? Actually, um, I would say at some point there there was uh, in in the beginning yes, and even ongoing to be quite honest, um, and 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 to take it even a step further, you know as an oral surgeon you know I'm also training periodontists so I got friction from my own society believe it or not on a national level so and the irony of it all is the folks that threw stones at me early on, all of them to the person to this day ended up in some capacity <laughs> doing the same kind of thing. That's so I, awesome. I, could, I could look back and, and say, well, you know, look at that guys, you put me through so much crap for what? At the end of the day, I've opened up my, my courses from day one to everybody That's because cool. the fellow, one of the key individuals who influenced my career is Carl Mish and God rest his soul. And I spent time with Carl from the, what was the uh, late eighties? Um, and just, I just audited the courses. I didn't need life surgery in that, but I, I learned basically 
the biomechanics of what we do today. Because in the 80s for me, 83 to 90 or so, when I started my practice, uh, we all did things in spite of ourselves. I had placed at that time over a thousand implants and some, I'd say most implants were succeeding in spite of me. Didn't really know what was going on. Then I began to understand the science thanks to him. Now he's a general dentist. At the end of the day, got a prostate degree later and everything else, but he's still a general dentist. But his credit, a brilliant general dentist who continued to learn like no one I've ever known in my career, photographic memory. I can go on and on. That man influenced me to this day more than any other person professionally. Mm. So wow. now, so now, would I be not hypocritical to say, hmm, okay, um, move, you know, taking that a step forward, why would I discriminate? In other words, if if the folks he learned from didn't said, you know, I, not your general dentist, even though they were GPs at the time, t- t- teaching GPs, I understand that. But my point is, who am I to to discriminate and say you or you or you can't take my courses? That's crazy. I that thought never entered my mind. So. In all of these 30 years, it's always been open. I have no problem with that. The issue I think I have today, quite honestly, is that, yeah, there's that jealousy factor. It's going to always be there. I get that. It's not even an issue for me. It's just that folks need to get that out of their head that, look, this is an equal opportunity country. We're a democracy. Okay, we all can learn as much as we want, as we should. In any, with any venue, but but here's what I'm really trying to say is that my courses, I make it very clear to everybody, because uh, what I'm teaching is at a little bit more advanced level than certainly basic level uh, information, but at the end of the day, I tell everybody the same thing. Look, we're done now with these three or four days. Here's what I'm going to part, my, some of my parting words to all of you, and that is that let's draw this proverbial line in the sand, and on this side is our comfort zone. And on this side is the dark side, okay? In other words, I'm going to suggest to all of you that you stay on this side. Be careful what you're doing. Do things within the scope of your comfort zone. Don't get swayed, especially by a patient that might say, Doc, I don't want to go 30 miles across town to go see Dr. Joe Blow. You know, you can do it. I know you can do it. And, well, you know, I did see a video and, well, shoot, you know, maybe, uh, yeah, okay. And now... The bottom line is we are all, including me, we're one case from never practicing again. So I share that with everybody. And at the end of the day, I think that rings louder than anything I will have said over the entire course in terms of impact, because it's true. And I mean it from my heart. I don't want anybody getting into trouble and problems. The attorneys are all over on every corner. We know that. They're just waiting for you know the right moment. So bottom line is learn what you can incorporate it quickly after you've learned it but the bottom line is don't push it to where you're not comfortable because the problems you know yeah exactly we've got enough of that going on with all of us not just generalists but specialists too we we have we know you know that it's an equal opportunity problem for everybody unfortunately if you violate that basic concept that's gonna that's gonna ring true. I'm gonna hear you saying that the rest of my uh, you know, the rest of my career is that you're one case away from never practicing again. It's the truth. You know, you you build you build all these time and hours and money and everything, away, and you're one you're one cowboy move away from ruining it all potentially. And exactly. and that's not to say say only sit on the sidelines and and play play the safe game. But I think to your point, like be self aware enough to say, yeah, I'm pretty comfortable with this and then go for it. Right. Or learn more or keep pushing the needle, but don't say shit. I saw a video on this. I think I can do it. Like yeah. that's just reckless. Exactly. And- it's called commitment. And this <laughs> is, this is the only problem I have with anybody taking any of these courses. It, you have to commit, you know, you can't dabble. And, and Carl Mish talked about that from way back. You know, it's all in, you, you know, you're either all in or you're not. If you try to dabble, you will have problems. I, I promise you. So the commitment is there. Unfortunately, you know, folks want to go to heaven. They don't want to die. You've heard that. It's called commitment. So if you want it, you know, learn it like you should, then commit. And I, I give, you know, Perry all the credit. He's been here multiple times. I know he sings my praises, but at the end of the day, it's he's he's the one who implements what he's learned from myself, oh, yeah. from John Coyce, where I'm a scientific advisor. You know, with all these different courses he's taken over time in his young years already, he's implemented. That's the yeah. key, implementation. Learning, it's one thing, but if you don't, you know, implement and apply it, 
then you may as well not have even taken the course, yeah. but I give him all the credit. Yeah. And it's folks like that, whether they're specialists or generalists, that you have to give credit to. Why not? They're, they're doing it. They're doing it well. Yeah, I, I, it reminds me of a quote. Well, first of all, Pei Ray, I was asking him, and I could disclose this because he told me it's okay. He spent last year about f- almost $60,000 in CE courses, and that's pretty typical for him to spend per year, Sure, 60000 Sure, I, I Tony, believe that. Tony Robbins has a great quote. It says, uh, knowledge is not power. Execution is power. So just because like you that. know it, it's potential power. But like and that. then while you're talking about Mike, did we talk? Are you a pilot as well? Or like I'm no. like okay. No. So I'm a, I'm I'm a I'm a private pilot. I just remember one thing my flight instructor said to me right before I soloed for the first time. He says, "Look, you got a full bag of luck and an empty bag of experience right now. Oops. The goal with flying is to fill your bag of experience before your bag of luck runs out." Ouch. <laughs> so how true. You, it's commitment. Uh, no, no, it is commitment. Absolutely. And, and, and along that line, I, I literally, I have averaged 140 hours of CE my in, per year. My entire, oh my I've got over 5,000 hours of CE. And we're not talking, you know, sign in, go to the beach. No, no, no. It's sign in, front row, tape recorder. I'm one of those obsessive people. To this day, I continue okay. to learn. And I don't count that I'm at a symposium and that's part of my CE. No, I'm talking real courses. Wow. I, I love learning. There's so much to learn. It's crazy. And, and just trying to keep up is, is insane. But you know what? At the end of the day, that's important to, to me. And therefore, if I'm going to educate and be at the top of my game, I need to be as current as I can be. And, and the funny thing is about human nature is people look at you and just say, oh, well, he's made it. He's got it easy because he's Mike Picos, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's what people do. I was listening to a podcast with Michael Phelps, you know, and his workouts and his insane. And I mean, we can draw millions of analogies from sports Tiger Woods last week, but I mean, people will look at you and, and, and not recognize what goes on in private. I would have never thought that you're doing that. I would have never thought at this level that you're still Mm. learning like a novice. That's, that's novice type, you know, acquisition of knowledge, that, that type of that, that appetite is like a beginner. And, and, and what, there's so many quotes about what learn, like, you know, stay, uh, I'm sure you, you guys could fill in for it. No, well, the ambition is there. And that's what I think. Maybe it's a two edged sword. I don't know, but um, I do, I do enjoy learning. And um, now with, um, in the next few months, um, quintessence will be publishing um, um, my first and probably only book that I'll, I will have worked on because it's a labor of love and, and it's, it's insanity for the time element committed to it. If it weren't for Rick Myron, my uh, great faculty member and um, great colleague to uh, help me through this, uh, it would never happen. But um, in a few months, we'll have that book published. And uh, it will pretty much reflect a lot of you know, where I'm at and have been in terms of currency of, of, my, of my work. Um, but even more important than a book is, as you mentioned, uh, Craig, earlier, that that the impact is not just on the clinicians that I've impacted directly with my courses and thousands of others through my lectures over the years everywhere, but more importantly is the patients that have benefited from that. That's again, the, the ultimate uh, to me. Yeah. It reminds, it, it's, it's such a neat thing to, to, to hear your, your heart and your generosity, your enthusiasm. I mean, I'm, I'm fired up and you're doing, you're doing you're doing a lot more than I am, a lot more than Pete and I put together, and uh, I I think it's really cool that um, you know even even when you wanted to come over and check us out off of like just you wanted to come over to my office and you did that so quickly just based off of some one person said hey you know I worked at this place and come check it out like immediately how you just wanted to soak it all up but I think it's just a good lesson for all of us it's a it's a it's a great life lesson to be relentless in your pursuit of growth. Well, and by the way, I I very much appreciate how open and gracious th- that you uh, were to accommodate me in, in, in such a short time from the time I talked to you on the phone to the time I literally came down and spent the day. I want to really see your, your office, which is fabulous. Nothing like I've ever seen. And uh, your whole operation is just uh, over the top. But see, I think I've always said this, you know, real pros share. See, real professionals share. We don't have any issue with anything. See, and, and that's what I admire 
in our field, in our profession the most, because the individuals who are confident what they're doing are more than happy to share. And that's true for any walk of life. The ones that are paranoid, you know, it's almost like dental school. You have folks that, you know, scared to death to, or not so much scared, but just did not want to help you in any way or form is that paranoia kind of concept and you know what have you that's that that's bad that's there's, there's no place for that you know but real pros share and, and i appreciate that from you uh immensely well likewise i mean it was an amazing day for me i mean to have you there and the conversation yeah, he, had, he was giddy like a schoolgirl. girl I, yeah <laughs> I was like, see, see that dr picos he, he was waiting for that zinger he had that one i got mean, he's he got a plan i i could tell he's got no podcast is complete no, no but podcast is complete without a little yeah <laughs> humility too i want to i want to speak about humility and i think there, there's a, one of the prices you pay for greatness, whatever you're pursuing, is you're gonna, if you're willing to go out in front and lead the charge and stand for something like you did early on, you're gonna get arrows in your back. And uh, uh, you gotta do it for the right reasons. Uh, you know, I, I, I must admit that there's always a, for me at least, there's some form of ego component of like, oh, I wanna stand out in front and teach people and all that stuff. But when it really comes down to it, um, when you get some arrows in your back and you get the naysayers and the people that are talking about you, it, it's gotta be something more than that to fill the tank, to keep you going forward. And it's that altruism. It's that paying it forward and giving never depletes you. Giving is kind of opening a channel to allow more to flow through you. And I just th think that there's a universal law of just paying it forward and it just comes back around. I mean, what an honor for me to, to get an email from you to say, you want to check what out, what I'm doing. I mean, that, that it's just, I mean, how could I not want to share, but I, but, but the same, in the same vein, I'll get Pete and I get guys that are, we've got a guy right now, Trey, that's talking to us, Trey, you're listening. I'm sure, um, you know, we want to call you out. We got guys that are just dreaming about their plans and they're not even through dental school. Some of these people and Pete and I are, pouring into these people we will pour into them because it's just you just want to be the leader or the educator that you had when you were i just wish i had someone i hope yeah, that doesn't we all stand on the shoulders of giants right and you yeah, remember the people well, that that helped you and it's it, you're right it's it's almost um there's it's some incumbent kind of, upon it's incumbent it, upon us of to, much is given much is required it is it's it's true i mean it's exactly it's, it's absolutely true and that blessing needs to be passed forward so that's super super cool <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree. And humility is a big one. Uh, there's nothing worse than than beating your chest about, you know, something you did. Uh, I'll tell you, my dad would have cracked my head in half had I even thought of that because he, he pretty much made it clear as a kid to, uh, you know, father to son that, you know, you and it's biblical. You don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. That's it. End of conversation. So if you boast, you're going to get leveled in some way or form hmm. so yeah, it's true from a pure spiritual perspective you no know, humility is is at the i think at the heart of the core values that that um you know we need to embrace and and, and certainly pass on to our kids and and to our colleagues our young colleagues and what you folks are doing is truly uh an amazing uh thing in and of itself the book you wrote t together is one thing but then you know your podcast and every other way that you're reaching out to all of these individuals is to your credit. And I think uh, it's, it's definitely a, a great win-win scenario. Yes. Thank you for that. So, so I'm going to out Pete on this one. Pete called me yesterday. <laughs> I'm not going to give a lot of details to it because he's, he's a little bit more private. I'm a little bit of a book, but Pete called me yesterday. Um, just kind of upset about something, you know, something kind of knocked the wind out of his sails like it does for all of us. We have a very special friendship and one that I'm extremely thankful for because it's one thing for you to be able to share with uh, someone who, who doesn't really do what you do and they can't really relate. But Pete and I have that relationship where we're both, we're both getting the, not, the wind knocked out of ourselves, just like you and the rest of us. And, and, and Pete, um, we had a conversation about six o'clock last night and I was like, listen, Matt, man, this is exactly what you need. You know, there's breakdown and breakthrough and you, you, you get what you, exactly what you need. It doesn't make sense at the moment, um, but it, it's exactly what you need. And, and I, I started rattling off some things that I think this could mean because he was making real meaning out of it. He was sure about the meaning. He's like, this is what it's going to be. I'm like, Pete, maybe it's, you just need to be more you know, in touch with people. They need to see you more. They, they, you need more empathy because every time you get your ass kicked, one thing that goes up after that is empathy. You feel I mean, I, I, you know, I've, I'm human. I've got my own, my own vices, but judgment for me, 
so quick to judge sometimes like that guy's bad, that guy's good. And then I went through some stuff this last year. We got accused of something that was not true. And now every time someone talks about someone else, I'm like, there's three sides to every story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not going to be a part, you know, it's empathy. It makes us relatable and it's, it's part of the human experience. And for those that are listening that are, that are like, Oh yeah, well, it's easy for Mike Pigo. It's easy for Dr. Bolden. You know, it's not, it's not easy for any of us. No. And as we get, I, I think it's an important message and, and it, we're, we're humans just like we're all, we're all, we're all, we all have our vices and our challenges, but don't resent the challenges and embrace the challenges. I think, I don't know why I'm in such a, uh, philosophical mood, well, philosophical mood. I'm not sure. Mike, again, Dr. Picos brings it out. Of me. Again, I, I can, I can relate to that Craig, honestly, and what you said is really so true and so powerful because at the end of the day, honestly, um, we're all human. And, and, and because of that, you know, we're not drill presses. We're 99.99% of the time you can predict everything and, you know, tolerances, this is, no, no, we're, we're all different as humans, but what we have in common are frailties. And, um, and with that said, you know, we're, we're going to have our, our ups and downs, uh, you know, on the surface, everything looks great. And if I have any issue with, um, this new tech, you know, high tech and not technology in particular, social media, it's the following. It is that, you know, on social media, unfortunately, what's portrayed is is a perfect scenario, whether it's a perfect case being presented, uh, a perfect life, you know, this, this and that. And studies have shown that folks that spend an inordinate amount of time just on Facebook alone are depressed people. Right. That's an unfortunate They're directly thing. directly proportional, right? You know, the amount of time that you spend and there's a, and there's a curve where, where you know, yeah, it really is the tipping point. Exactly. The point. And it, it's, it starts, there's a direct correlation between. To a degree, I think it's great for all of us. We can certainly learn so much. But at the end of the day, too, you know, even in this might be a little bit of a knock and I might ruff, ruffle a few feathers across the, the globe here. But, you know, I do have an issue with folks just posting cases. This is what I did last month, last week, yesterday, this morning, right yeah. now. Full Arch that's, Friday. That's, that's wonderful. Yeah. But now show me that case in five years or better yet. How about if we have a platform that says minimum five to 10 year follow-ups and how about another one from 10 to 15 or, or 20 to 30 or more than 30. See, now you're going to see, you can count on fingers, maybe who's really yeah. going to be able to post. And I'm not trying to be a smart ass. It's just that the reality is that, you know, if you're only showing this, then that's okay. But unfortunately the reader, the viewer is going to get maybe a different impression that like this is the best case. They may not know that potentially it took five hours to do this case when normally it would be an hour, hour and a half, but it's got to be so picture perfect, this, this, and that. And that's the only thing I'll say. And I, again, at the risk of ruffling too many feathers, you know, I just a caution to the younger folks out there viewing these cases, what have you, that's great. Nothing wrong. We're all learning myself included, but just be careful as to, you know, what, how you interpret things. And it's like anything else, you know, um, it, it, unfortunately, um, perception is reality, but at the same time, be careful because yeah. there's so many other factors that could be involved in, you know, any particular image, video, whatever that you don't know about. That's all I'll say and, and leave it for what it's worth. Again, I'm not trying to sound holier than now. Not at all. Not anywhere. Well, no, on, on the exact opposite. In fact, I mean, I, I would, I would put it, put out there that there's guys that have your clinical understanding and your education, but they're not relatable and they're not, they're not humble enough for people to receive the message. The beauty of, of being a, a, an iconic educator like you is that you, you have a, a way of speaking and of being that says, I can, I could, I, I identify. He's not, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, it's not egoic because it, you'll lose people. You'll lose people. And if your difference, if your, if your drive is to make a difference and actually help people, it does you no good to, to be, to be, uh, to be, you know, puffing at your chest and you won't relate, you know? And, and I think that's a really important thing. Uh, um, and something that, uh, we all go, th I think we all go through that. Um, you know, I, I, if you would have asked me five or 10 years ago, what, how I felt about what I knew, I, I knew a lot more then than I know now, you know, I guess that's one of the signs of getting a little older, but I feel like I know so much less, I'm so much less sure of sure. everything, sure. but I'm actually happier. It's not good to feel certainty. Especially when it's, when it's I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Totally understand. And, and again, <laughs> very profound, but you know, we were, we're really um, 
saying the same thing. And, and what I, what impressed me probably the most in, in meeting you uh, that day, especially was that, you know, your humility and it, and it comes across again. Now uh, th that is critical as a core value, as I see it in, in order to be successful and most importantly, be honest about what, what we do um, because without humility and of course, integrity is right behind it. Um, then I don't think there's a message that's worth listening to. Yeah. And I mean, listen, I know, you know, Kyle Stanley, uh, he's on a, a real personal um, mission to identify the incredible suicide and drug abuse that exists in our profession. And it's, it's, it's swept under the rug. But, you know, I think that the, the social media stories and the things that people are doing, it, it, it makes, it can easily make you feel like you're a failure, even when you're not. And I mean, and, and, we have a, a wealthy country. So if you're, if you're making only this much money, you feel like you're, you're not successful enough. And, and many places in the world, they, they make 15, $20,000 a year and they're living like Kings and they don't worry about that stuff. So I think it's, it's, it's a bigger conversation that, that I, I try to have that, um, that no, no matter where you are, you're, you're on the right path and keep growing and keep doing what you're doing. And, and you've got great people to, to like you, Dr. Picos, to, to follow and emulate. And not only emulate from the clinical aspect, but listen to the words, listen to humility, listen to the desire for learning and the beginner mentality that he still has at his level. So, you know, if you've been out of school for two years and you're trying to tell everybody you know it all, that's not a fun place to be because it's scary. You don't know it all. And not, neither, none, of, none, none of the three of us know it all. Um, and I, I want to just pivot one second because we only have a couple minutes left. Um, you know, because you, you talked about how you were getting some pushback from the specialists and, and educating the GPs. One thing that's important to understand too is, is, is the bravado of some of the specialists that come out. Like there's, some, there's, there's a dangerous mentality for a newly minted specialist. You know, because you were under the auspices of your residency and even some of the OMF guys, um, you know, are coming out of trauma units. So they're kind of lost in their trajectory because it's such a broad training that they go through. They literally put faces back together, uh, you know, and, and their gross motor skill. I mean, it's like. I put a whole face back together. Like you're really picking about a papilla. Come on, buddy. Like, why are you worried about this papilla between eight and nine? Like it's relatively successful. So it's, it's hard. I want you to speak about the oral surgery training and, and where you feel like um, where there could be improvements overall into like those specialty training. I, I want to, I want you to speak to oral surgery specifically, actually, if you don't mind. Sure. I'd be happy to. In fact, I've, I've got, um, I'm very passionate about what I have to say here. And that is that um, unfortunately, uh, my specialty group, Amos in, in particular, has cho chosen to take the route of uh, going back to a double degree curriculum, which I'm completely opposed to. Uh, I don't mean across the board, but, and that's what they, that's what they're doing more or less, that very few programs exist now that are conventional four year, meaning oral surgery. Now it's a combined degree. Uh, so our kids are spending six, seven years in training, getting actually less oral surgery exposure than we did in, in, in a four-year program. And um, as a result, as it is, even in four-year coming out with, as you say, a lot of high-end um, background experience in terms of orthopedic surgery, TMJ, oncology, you know, et cetera. Uh, now, go back to the dual degree. These folks come out, they have a medical degree that they can't practice with. You got to do a minimum one year internship. Typically, a number of these folks will then go on to a, a residency in ENT or plastics, or perhaps in oncology. All wonderful, you know, arenas to be practicing in, certainly. But let's just say that dual degree person goes into private practice as an oral surgeon. Okay, well, uh, I will tell you that that individual, if he's now got to compete against uh, a well trained uh, periodontist and/or GP doing surgical work as they have learned then I'll tell you what, that's a huge, huge disadvantage because the implant training, just as an example, in most any of those programs is minimal. I mean, we're talking uh, a handful of implants in most programs, and that just means drilling the hole, put the implant in, and that call it a day. In the aesthetic zone, 
clueless, completely mm -hmm. clueless. Because as I've always said, you know, we're trained as surgeons in maybe centimeters, periodontists are trained in millimeters. There's a huge difference. And as you say, what's the big deal about a papilla? <laughs> well, let me tell you, after having taken a number of courses over the years, uh, in particular microsurgery courses with uh, Otto Zur from, uh, from Germany, and I can go on and on. And my soft tissue learning curve began in the 90s, late 90s with P.D. Miller, Pat Allen. Those are the two names that kept popping up when I said, I need to learn soft tissue, realizing the importance of it for bone in particular and depth of the aesthetic zone. Well, long story short, these folks embraced me. No issues. I went down, spent time with them and other periodontal colleagues over the years. And as a result, I've seen a true synergy among those specialty groups. And I was really among the first to really embrace that concept. And you talk about arrows in the back for that one. I'll tell you what, they're still there, the, the scars. And that's okay. I never really cared, to be honest. But I got hammered for that, again, for my own group. So back to our specialty training, it unfortunately is having heavily weighed now towards the dual degree concept, meaning less even basic surgery learned, let alone the most important tools that and, and, and weapons, so to speak, that my folks need, especially especially coming out, i.e. to compete, and that is not just taking teeth out, but now let's, what are we learning about real implant placement and soft tissue, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, to me, a, a, an Achilles heel for, for the specialty. I think we're headed in the wrong direction. All this high-powered training, orthognathics, TMJ, you name it, pathology, trauma, when it comes down to private practice, at the end of the day, 95% of my specialty group is office-based. And I even got to sit down early in my practice. Year one, I had a good friend of mine, uh, Tom Walsh, oral surgeon, convinced me I could sit down and not lose any speed. And he was right. And it's even saved my career to continue to practice because I was in a bad MVA accident about, oh, uh, seven, eight years ago. I shouldn't even be here today. I was T-boned by a dump truck going six, 65 miles an hour, weighing 70 ton. Now imagine oh 35,000 pounds at that speed, T-bones me. And I made it through that whole thing without a broken bone. However, the soft tissue injuries you can imagine, but at the end of the day, it was a blessing, a miracle for me to be alive and make it through. And with some PT today, I'm fine. But the fact that I can sit has really made a huge difference. My point is, I'm comfortable doing what I'm doing over time and that's true for 95% of my specialty group as oral surgeons. The other 5% hospital-based, that's great. We sure need them, no question. But what are, we, what are we looking at? To me, the training should be oral surgery and then maxillofacial like Europe. If yeah. you're an oral surgeon, you're like Boozer. You're office-based, you're doing your thing. If you're hospital-based, oncology, TMJ, orthognathics, all that, you're in the hospital. That's fine, you're a true maxillofacial surgeon. Here you're an oral surgeon. There's nothing wrong with that. Not a damn thing. But the way I see it, our guys as oral surgeons, we're missing the boat in terms of the training element. And hence the need for, forget my courses only, but others. The challenge for all of us, as I see at dental school, even our specialty programs are boot camp. You want to learn? Now it starts from this point forward. And I've preached that to my two children. My, our daughter's with us as a periodontist for a year and almost two years. And our son will be finished up in a year and a few few months as a periodontist joining the practice. So you know, think about it. it starts when you start practice, start taking the CE learning and you know, it's lifelong. I'm happy you said all that because it's exactly what, I, what I've always been thinking um, as far as that, but it, it's, it obviously carries a lot more credibility when you say that. Uh, and I, but I do, I, do, I do postulate that the reason why you have more general dentists in your course is not because of economics, there's a lot of guys that, that, are, that are doing it because they were sending to the local specialist and they lost the papilla, they lost the angle. I mean, there's just, and they're like, look, I've got to control the result. My patient's demanding that I, when I put the tooth on, does, they don't go back to the oral surgeon and say, hey, where's my papilla or, this, or the periodontist, where, this angle. They look to the general dentist to deliver the result and we have to eat it. So these guys was born in necessity. One of the reasons why I got deep into Invisalign is because I was seeing the orthodontic result that I was getting. Really, I mean, if you've, if I've done spear training and occlusal courses, many orthodontists haven't done that. Agreed. I mean, unless they've done it on their own volition. But it's, it's up to them. Like you said, it's a license to learn. And if, if your last day of learning is the day you leave that specialty program, 
JP is going to blow by, blow by you. Totally agree, Craig. Totally. And I've had that same feedback over the years where why would any general dentist really, uh, the economic element is one thing, sure, but more so is exactly that. I've had so many folks coming through my courses telling me exactly the same thing. Doc, you know, I, I, I got tired. I just got frustrated getting these kind of results. And I know I can do basic things for sure. Onesies, twosies, et cetera. I want to control from the, from the, you know, with the end in mind kind of thing. Sure. You know, top down, you bet. And, and since I know the restorative, this, I can, I can do the surgery. I've got it all. Why not? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, listen, I know we have a hard stop here, Dr. Picos, and you've been extremely generous and just what an, just what a, what a blessing to the profession you are. And I mean that sincerely, you really are. Um, not only just the, all the accumulation of knowledge that you've, that you've uh, acquired over all the years, but the style in which you communicate and the, and the humility is, is, is such a great space to receive the information. So it's, it's just awesome. Thank you. Well, Greg uh, and Peter, I, I thank you both uh, for your time and for this opportunity. And if I could leave um, our audience with, with one, one message, and especially for the younger folks in particular, but it, I think it applies to everybody, certainly. And that is that to not lose focus on the, you know, the family element, because it's easy to do. And I have crossed that line more than a few times. Unfortunately, I've had a great wife who's been understanding over the years. But it, at the same time, you know, it, it's never good to be overloaded in the arena that you love so much, which we are all passionate about. I know that. But it's easy to do it 24-7 to the point where guess who gets, you know, the short end of the stick? It's your family. Yeah. So I had to learn it early on enough to where, you know, okay, I got the big picture. And to this day, I'll tell you what, it's so important because at the end of the day, your true legacy when all is said and done is your family. Everything else really doesn't matter. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. Thank you for that. I want to also uh, plug two things we'll put in our show notes as well, but you got the uh, Partners in Synergy, the Picos and Salama event at the Ritz-Carlton, which is beautiful in Orlando, June 20th through 22nd, and also the annual symposium, the Pico Symposium 2018, which uh, is going to be coming up. Oh, I'm sorry. No, uh, I got it wrong here. It's the... Uh, yeah, the, yeah. The our synergy course is in June, and then in the fall we've got uh, our annual symposium, which the theme this year is on full arch immediate reconstruction, which will be outstanding. Uh, we've got a, a, an array of international speakers uh, for that, that uh, just over the top. But yeah, I appreciate you mentioning those. Were they're always fun, and the synergy course in particular with Maurice, we've been doing this 16 years. So again, uh -huh. there's there's a synergy between periodontist and oral surgeon. I mean, where do you see that? You know, three days on the same podium, same time playing off each other's material, which we never rehearse, you know, it's impossible mm. to. Um, but yet, you know, those are the things that, again, make it all worthwhile is, is you know, it's about people, like we, we said from the get-go, you know, look at you two. I mean, look at that synergy. It's amazing. It's all about people. And and the more, you know, I told my kids from way, way back, you know, the more people you know, the more successful you are. That's, I think, at the heart of everything. And this field just lends itself so beautifully to meeting so many neat people. Uh, including, of course, our patients. So yeah, that's, uh, true. that's what it's all about. Awesome. Well, thank you so very much, Dr. Picos. This is awesome. Thanks, yeah, thank uh, you Peter, for being here and organizing the podcast. And uh, until the next time, we're out. Thank you. Signing out. Take care.